Many countries face serious challenges in dealing with water scarcity across Africa, including South Africa. The city of Johannesburg and the Borehole Water Association have joined forces in creating awareness around alternative water sources to alleviate the impacts of the drought currently affecting parts of Southern Africa. About two and a half, three years ago, looking at our water demand within the city of Joburg, and given the background in that Gauteng is a net importer of water from uh, Lesotho Water Highlands. Now, national government is, uh, and, and, and Lesotho are embarking on a second phase of the Lesotho Water Highlands, Purihari Dam, which is expected to be commissioned around 2024. So the feasibility is underway and so on and so on and so forth. Now, the biggest challenge that we have, particularly in Gauteng and by extension, within the city of Johannesburg, is that Gauteng has now become the most populous province. It used to be Guazulu Natal, and the majority of that population, uh, 5 million out of 12 million and growing, is sitting within uh, the city of Johannesburg area of jurisdiction. Uh, given the inefficiencies, you know, aging infrastructure, the condition of the infrastructure, uh, uh, unaccount for water, both physical and commercial in terms of, uh, you know, the levels of uh, payment for water that has been consumed. Uh, we really are facing an ongoing challenge, given another fact that the city of Johannesburg still remains the economic hub of South Africa. We need to ensure that there is a security of supply of water. People must have water. We, we Local government's responsibility is the provision of basic services and water remains a critical service. So for, uh, for us, we need to satisfy that um, DDS paradigm that we must secure water for people, secure that people, uh, ensure that people have secured a supply of electricity as well. I think the, it's the time, there's a drought, there's an increased demand on, on water, the, the Johannesburg um, metro has expanded the, the system that is here to actually supply water to the metro is obviously limited. We're now importing water from the Lesotho Highland scheme. So there's a finite amount of water that we got. And the Johannesburg water has been quite forward and quite forward thinking about this to say there is a potential to actually decrease the, the, the demand on, on, um, on Joburg water. And let's get people who can afford a borehole, draw boreholes to actually take off the demand of Joburg water. If we stand here, below us the, the, the earth is saturated from a certain level and the groundwater in Bryanston area, the groundwater levels are about 15 metres below surface. So what happens is that you, you drill a borehole, you have to go below the, the groundwater level and then you hope to intersect a fracture that then is able to feed groundwater into your borehole. So you then intersect this fracture, you're then able to abstract that. Groundwater is replenished by recharge. The recharge is from rainfall, so that it's an active system, so it's not a fossil water. So you actually get rainfall recharged into the groundwater and you're abstracting that, 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 that rainfall that is actually into the groundwater system. There's a, there's a delay time between rainfall recharge, so the water you might be extracting might be you know, a decade old or something like that compared to you know, the rainfall that occurred today. Although relatively costly to place, having a borehole puts you in control of your water supply. You have to have a, enough money to actually be able to drill the borehole, equip the borehole um, with a with a pump, and then run the borehole after that. The other thing is that if you're on a domestic property, you're not always 100% sure you're going to get water because you know your neighbour might have water because he's in a different geological structure or he intersected a fracture. So the, the disadvantage is, that am I going to get water if I drill on my property? And there's no real guarantee to that, other than we can tell you what the geological formation is and uh, what, the, what the chances of getting water in that geological formation are. Cost your household, obviously there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a different phases. So the cost you first you've got to do is you've got to drill the borehole. And then you pay a rand per meter or a dollar per meter to drill that borehole. 
Once you drill the bore and that's usually to about 60 to 100 meters, and you'll pay anything from 200 rand to 300 rand a meter to drill to drill that hole. Then once it's successful, you obviously have to case it. And casing is a is a, a, a steel sleeve that you put in the bore to keep the the, the bore hole um, stable. And then once so that's additional cost, and that also costs you about 200 to 300 rand a meter, and you'll probably case about one third of the bore. So if you drilled 60 meters, you probably case about 20 meters of the bore. Then you test it to see, um, to see how much water is in there. Then you purchase the pump and then you connect it to the, to the system. So you probably, for a domestic household, you're probably looking at the region of about 60 to 100,000 rand, depending how deep you drill. And then that's your total capital costs. And your operating cost after that is just your electricity. And it uses less uh, electricity than your hairdryer. Lungi Ledlamini, MD of Johannesburg Water, highlights the impacts of the drought on the city, which has a population of 4 million people. At the height of the uh, drought, uh, where we had um, you know, higher than normal temperatures uh, and a lack of rainfall, um, we had problems in supplying high-lying areas. As most of the citizens in Joburg will be aware, we buy water in bulk from rainwater. And at the peak or at the height of the, you know, uh, the same time, rainwater's capacity to actually produce more water, which in turn we would then procure, fill up our service storage reservoir, and then distribute or reticulate to our, to our customers and consumers. They couldn't. It was exceeded. So if you look at demand and supply, so demand outstrips supply during those months. Uh, particularly in the high-lying areas because the way the system works is that we have to first fill up the reservoirs on the ground before we can fill up the towers. So you need a certain head so that you can fill up the towers. And the towers, once they're filled, then we gravitate from there to supply water in high-lying areas. So that was the problem. And if you look at the population of South Africa, or rather let me use the number of households, properties, about 1.5 million, about 40,000 were affected in high-lying areas. But then we mobilized, you know, water tankers. We also, jointly with Rainwater, decided that we need to manage the system, or rather operate the system jointly during that period, which assisted a great deal. And by saying we manage the, you know, the system jointly, what we would do is that we would do what we call load shifting. I know in electricity there's what load shedding, but we did load shifting. Load shifting in areas where our reservoirs are interconnected and in areas where the demand wasn't as high, so we would skim, you know, the certain levels of the reservoirs to the areas where the demand was high. So we call that load shifting. The interconnectivity obviously is between our reservoirs and rainwater and within our service storage reservoirs, we also have interconnectivity. What we've learned from this is that we also need to, you know, in anticipation of what could happen in the future, invest in that interconnectivity of the system because not all this, uh, the, 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 our service storage reservoirs particularly are interconnected. On the whole, especially after introducing level two water restrictions, where we would then impose fines if people uh, irrigated their gardens between uh, or outside of 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Those water restrictions are still in force because the threat of the drought is still there. The drought has certainly emphasized the importance of water conservation with the possibility of penalties being imposed on those who waste. We are still at level two that we said we are going to be in, in, in November last year. So the worst case scenario is us going through at uh, level three. That says if you don't save water and we feel that you're wasting water, we can actually switch off your water. Then you must come to us and ask us why and we enter into an arrangement. And there's a penalty of about 3,000 grants penalty. So we don't want to penalize people. Hence for me, education and awareness remains important. So that by the time we come and become punitive, we would have taken communities and individuals through their responsibilities, their roles, then we can be punitive. So we are not at level three yet. We're still sitting at level two and encouraging people to use water sparingly. Don't uh, fill up swimming pools with water from our taps. Don't wash your car using a hose pipe. You know, ensuring that all leaks are closed and are resolved.
Aside from borehole water, the city has also been looking into other alternative water supplies, such as reusing grey water and rainwater harvesting. Grey water is sourced from bathroom sinks, showers, tubs and washing machines. You know, uh, the drought almost like put a damper on it was the rainwater harvesting, which we're going to embark on with rainwater, the rainwater board. So we've just put a hold on that in terms of programming, but we will also be doing that particularly at schools, affordability as well, looking at the economic outlook and all of that has become an issue. We are not shelving it, but we are deferring it, but we will also be looking at that rainwater harvesting, particularly at schools where those rainwater harvesting tanks will be linked to the ablution facilities. So instead of using drinking water to flush, you know, um, uh, uh, the toilets at schools, then you can use rainwater harvested. That's one. And then um, in the foreseeable future, but you know, um, <laughs> it's a sensitive one. We had a delegation that visited Singapore two years ago to explore their uh, technology on uh, what we call tertiary treatment of wastewater, not just to industrial grade, but to portable drinking water. And they call it new water. It's another technology that you know, it's, it's in our back pocket. At some point, we may have to, um, once, we, once we have realized diminishing returns on the current programs, we may have to seriously, seriously look into that, whereby we will still have a mix, but a certain portion of our drinking water would actually be totally recycled wastewater. But that's in the future.